Okay, I'm going to start. Oh, I hate myself with microphones. God. <clears throat> I'm Ken Donzi. I'm with Trend Micro. Um, I'm going to start off. With, this is not going to be a Trend Micro presentation. It's paid for by Trend Micro. They paid my salary, paid my travel up here, but uh, I try to keep this a little bit more agnostic. So first thing is, um, I've been doing security now for 25-ish years or so. Um, officially, getting paid to do it. How I got started, though, I remember I was young. I'm in a store. My mom's shopping for clothes, and she's pulling out crap, and I'm thinking, uh, oh, what's those cameras? Then I start looking at the windows, right? If, how many people are old enough remember they used to have the foil tape around the window? I remember asking my dad, well, what's the foil for? He goes, well, that's detected break. I'm thinking, well, why can't I just cut around it and or cut a hole through it and attach it? It's like so many ways to bypass that, right? So I always start thinking, it's like, security, right? Of how to bypass, how to get around systems of control. However, back in those days, it didn't pay that well. So I got myself into Novell. How many people remember Novell? Yeah, okay. It shows your age. Um, got certified in it, had some great certifications. Um, got in the token ring. Token ring is very popular back in those days, uh, mid-90s or so, which caused me to get another very popular, useful certification called OS2. Um, that didn't last very long. Then I said, you know what? This is getting tiring. Uh, the, uh, this is about mid-90s now. And the term was get the right out. I was advising uh, the network, right? Getting the value out of the network. So I started looking into Cisco. And I took the CCNA test. Have you ever seen that test? It was every command Cisco ever had from the start of iOS to their current version. I passed it. And I said, I'm never going to touch another Cisco appliance again. Um. Uh, Got hired in a marketing company, had a yin and yang, yellow and black. Uh, they actually had some products sold, sometimes called Semantic. Um, got my CSSP, and because Trend does a lot in AWS, I had to get an AWS certification, but don't care. So that's my background, right? I remember um, also my parents sent me to Radio Shack to get uh, some programming experience on the uh, Trash 80s, Model 3s. Uh, my first one was actually one on the have the eight inch floppies, right? Um, from there, I went to computer camp at Ohio State on pre released IBM DOS and uh, IBM PCs. I don't know what I was doing there, it was like seventh grade. Ohio State is huge. Um, my high school, my grade school, my classes were like 40 people. Um, so I went to Ohio State for two weeks and I was lost, right? By the way, the other thing I like is history, right? I look at security as physical items, right? Because it's people can pictures, right? So you can picture a castle, right? There's a hardened fort, right? And you can see up there, there's little towers. You can shoot people from there. It's high up. You have to bring ladders, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at that first fort, right, that's the new tech or the uh, technology of that day. Uh, if you look at the one at the right, uh, that's what happens when you introduce a cannon to a hard surface, right? So they start bypassing these hard surfaces and needing ladders. These blew a hole through the side, right? So they start looking at it, and they start thinking, we need to improve defenses. So you're not seeing these angles, right? There's no way to put a ladder up without being shot out from the side, right? And then you see earth dams is a block the thing. So you start never, security never stops, right? You can't depend on one area. And this kind of goes into uh, World War II, right? The Maginot Line. Everyone knows that, right? France had their part of it, right? They were guarding it, and then they had a very hard structure, right? Hard solid things to shoot, you know, block stuff, right? And he had these plans. Well, if the tanks come up, they had these anti-tank things or rip a track off and put them in a track. You kind of see all this, you know, very well designed, right? And they depended on Belgium to cover the other side, right? Belgium built these series of forts, right? And they're kind of guarding all the bridges coming across the uh, different waterways. However, the, those forts were designed without the thought of what happened in World War I, what came out? Airplanes. Germany took that fort with 99 men. It was, I think it was some over 300 uh, Belgium army. Took that fort in about 90 minutes. Shape charges, airdrops, and uh, planes dropped on top of it. All the guns are horizontal, right? Everyone's looking for that attack and come across the bridge. Never thought about it, even though World War One's example of stuff coming down from above. So what happened? Well, Germany went around it, right? They went over that fort. It wasn't a very popular or one of the more strong forts, but the idea is they took that fort and went around all that hardened defenses, right? 
how many people see this today, right? We have this hard, solid firewalls, right? And you bypass it through a partner. Uh, Target's for a perfect example, right? They went through an HVAC vendor through their firewall. It's a little bit about malware, right? How many people remember some of these? Uh, Brain's the first one. I was in college. Uh, Howard's in college in Miller's Engineering because I was bored with the computers. Uh, I just remember that popping up. wasn't my specialty at the time. But I do remember Michelangelo. If you're old enough, you remember Michelangelo because it's in the news every time you read. In PC Magazine, uh, the more important computer shopper, you know, had articles on uh, Michelangelo. Um, very big, very popular. God, that's going to destroy the world. It's 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 going to happen. I don't think a single thing happened from that. But it was so. And then, you know, Peter Norton and uh, John McAfee made lots and lots of money selling antivirus uh, because of that, right? That was our first one. And they're very destructive stuff, right? How many people remember "I Love You"? Yeah, uh, I was unfortunate. I never got an "I Love You." I was pretty upset about that situation. Uh, my wife was pretty happy about that, but I'm thinking, why didn't I get one? Um, but if you look at it, it was a script, right? It was an email that tax that run that script, right? You would see this little happening for. Klez. I mean, remember, remember Klez. Uh, not as many. Interesting about Klez, well, I was at Semantic at that time. Um, they start seeing a bunch of these old viruses, like Michelangelo and Brain, coming back in their sensors. You know, this is 10, 15 years later in some cases, right? Where are these old ancient viruses, and this time, the operating system prevented that type of uh, boot sector stuff. How were they getting in? They found they started doing another sample of CLES. They started deeper into it. They start seeing domains in there. If you're part of, I think it was Key Bank, Bank One, there's another bank was one of the domains in there. If you see that, grab every file in that system and send it off. So it was grabbing. So it was causing that read action, all that stuff. And because that read, semantics say, hey, that's Michelangelo, that signature match, right? But the back end of that, that was sending documents off. Not all the versions, but some of the versions actually had uh, code to actually send it off. NIMDA was interesting. NIMDA from initial launch to being the top malware was about 20 minutes on the internet. That's a pretty fast spreading virus. Slammer's good. Sucksnet, everyone talks about targeted attacks. How many people remember how targeted Sucksnet was? It had to match the serial number of the uh, controllers for it to run. Talk about hiding yourself, right? You're really looking for very specific information. And what is interesting it did is it actually uh, changed the centrifuges and spun up, I think it was a 10% increase, but it's kept the controls uh, displayed saying that it was something different. Um, anyone know how you process uranium with a centrifuge? You have two different buckets, right? Uh, different masses, one bucket goes here, 238 goes in a different bucket. And how that spins is where that uh, material goes into. So changing that speed of that centrifuge just contaminates your, uh, your buckets with the wrong stuff. Uh, my son is actually in nuclear engineering. Um, he tells me how important that is. He, actually, one thing I didn't realize, they actually have detectors. Uh, they know by the sample of isotopes in the air whose nuclear weapon it was. This is the bottom that contaminates in the uh, uranium from the explosion. CryptoLocker, everyone loves CryptoLocker, right? That did a lot of damage. Um, Made a lot of money for those guys, too. They actually made uh, very good strides in tech support for those guys who are running that ransomware stuff. Uh, they used to be better than the anti-malware company's uh, support because they're getting money for it, right? They're going to help you through that problem to make sure that payment comes through. Uh, very popular. Technology comes in. Pay, those guys, WannaCry. Interesting about WannaCry, right? Oh, Pent, yeah, it was, if you can look at it, it was a script. Well, we saw that, and I love you type of stuff, right? WannaCry was kind of using the malware uh, with an exploit, internal blue. You'll know, see some more about that coming up, right? So we know about signatures, right? They're a fast way to detect yesterday's threats, right? Someone has to find it, someone has to process it, someone has to create that signature, and that's all in the past, right? Um, problem is, everyone knows that everyone has signature detection, or hopefully everyone has signature detection of some sort. Well, the bad guys can obfuscate, right? There's tools out there, there's uh, uh, sites or hosts to obfuscate that code for you. Basically change the signature. You can do it dynamically. And why a lot of these attacks you'll see coming up uh, was to bypass that uh, signature detection by obfuscating that code. So when, you know, we saw these attacks, so what did they start doing? Code signing. This is about approximately when I start seeing it become more and more popular, about 2008. You know, take that code, register who it is, make sure it's authorized sender of that code. You know, it's a nice idea, right? 
But however, you look at the list up there, right? Uh, was it 60% uh, for uh, Trojans? And you look at who's signing it. I'm looking at the top one. Isn't AVG an antivirus vendor? Aren't they supposed to be the good guys? They're signing the code. And you notice that one of the bars up there, the blue one, that's they're signing malware code. Well, these are supposed to be the guys protecting us. They're signing the same stuff that the uh, code signing is preventing it. So these technologies, right, we're trying to find a way to defend it. And in my life, I remember, how many people remember that semantic uh, comment, right? AV's dead. And to be honest, he was right. And when didn't believe it. He, remember, he just got bashed on Wall Street and everyone else. Uh, I think they mistook what he basically was trying to say. Signature detection is essentially dead. And the second one was one I actually ran into. I was actually explaining to this guy how malware is today, right? And he comes to me and goes, and this is a major healthcare company. He goes, well, I'm not reading about the signatures. He's not reading the names, right? He's not saying Michelangelo. He's not seeing these names of malware. It's like, well, how many people know who tacked Anthem? What malware was that? Was there a name to it? Well, yeah, it was the CIO, CTO's name attached. It was the company's name attached. It wasn't any of the malware was on there. Same thing with Target, right? No one knows what that name of malware is. So he comes with that comment. But if you look at the semantics case, right? I could take that same projection and change the lines, that same flow, right? So I look at back, you know, from his statement, yeah, there's a lawful lot of signatures. And back in 2003, you just shift everything down, it looks the same way. All right, for now, if it's, it's almost even a steeper curve just because you get a trace signature on the fly. <clears throat> and you look at that, the healthcare guy, right? 71% of the malware, uh, 71 of the breaches, how many people know a single malware that hit those as a breach? Maybe WannaCry for the UK. So this guy was thinking in the past, right? He is that old fort. He has that hard surfaces. He has everything good, right? He's not thinking what's happening today. Because a lot of the threats is not necessarily malware. If you look into this, is how many people heard of ZDI? Uh, ZDI is the um, Zero Day Initiative. It's a branch of Trend Micro's Tipping Point Group. They pay for exploits. So they're actually active researching. They're paying for guys coming up with this stuff. If you look at this trends, how many people heard of some of these companies? Snyder um, on the right side. And if you look at Anatech, you know who anyone here in manufacturing, industrial systems? That's an industrial control system. If you look at the amount of exploits now for that this year alone, how much it increased, right? So they're re attacking. And you look at Sucks, that's a re attack, attack against the industrial uh, controllers. Uh, the Allen Bradleys, et cetera, of the world. But what's happening today, right? Uh, we know signature detection is not very good. You can create signatures in the fly. So how are they getting stuff in? They're doing the file list. They're never writing to the hard drive, right? And in January, we saw about 2,400 of these, I guess, classes of uh, malware coming in. Uh, just a couple months ago, it was at 38, so about 75% already increased. Getting on to the, probably one of my favorite movies. Anyone kind of recognize this one? Yeah. There's a war out there, old friend. A world war. And it's not about who's got the most bullets. It's about who controls the information. What we see and hear, how we work, what we think. It's all about the information. That was 1992. That's actually one of my favorite hacker movies. Uh, okay, it doesn't have Andrew Jolie. That was a really nice part. Uh, Ver had movie as a hacker movie. But I look at that, right? It was a team of guys, right? There's not one specialty. Not everyone is very good at one thing. You have one guy's good at one part, one guy's a different part. He had a leader, kind of controlled them all, make sure everything is good. But in a sense, they're talking about information back in 1992 when this movie came out. How relevant is that today? Every attack today is not really disabling your systems as much as it is getting your information. Or not your information, maybe your company's information, or the places you support and uh, uh, spend your money out. So how many people know the telephone method of malware detection? Oh, come on. Yeah, you do. It's the pick up the phone. Uh, yeah, my system's not running that fast right now. Or I'm getting this on my screen. Or I can't access my documents. Or I can't do something, right? Well, that's your telephone method, right? And actually, that's how Target found out about their malware. The FBI happened to call. That's a, probably the worst phone call you're going to get as an IT guy. When the FBI is called, yeah, we found your credit card information on the dark web. Uh, probably not a good day for that guy. 
It was a really bad day for the CTO eventually, but next method is signatures, right? Everyone knows about signatures. That's kind of what this talk about. Uh, behavior monitoring. I'm going to go through each one of these. Machine learning and a sandbox method. So let's look at signatures, right? Signatures are good. They're fast. Uh, when you do a schedule scan, it doesn't seem fast, but you're looking at how many samples out there. In 2008, it was 1.5 million samples, and it's probably 10 times that today. If you're looking at actual samples, and we consolidate, and everyone does. It uh, doesn't take a lot of CPU cycles to do that. Um, it's file independent, right? We don't really care where it sits. OS day independent. If it's running on Linux, it's running on Apple OS, or if it's running on Windows, that signature looks the same across all those. All right. And that's known and named. The problem is it's because the known name because the vendor creates that signature. They're also the one who distributes it, right? Trend Micro takes about 20 minutes, and this is pretty much the same trend for everyone. For once we get a sample to put a signature out, and we're all about that same price within a minute or two each other. What we do is we take the sample, we decode it, say, yeah, this is something new, this is something threat, right? Um, we create a signature, we put it through a bunch of systems so we don't break anything. Uh, McAfee had this problem about six years ago. They came with a uh, uh, signature for a product and took out the XP systems, which is the exact same systems that helped us use, so they wiped out the whole help desk at the same time as putting out that signature. So we go through a lot of tests to make sure it doesn't break something. We put it on the site. Then your site has to call our site to get that signature. Then once you get the signature, then you have to push it to all the different systems. That's usually a two to three hour process. That's a long time in a day of malware, right? It's easy to change, right? I can say you can obfuscate. There's tools out there to make that signature look brand new. And it's only on file access, right? If it comes in a different method, like the, uh, um, sure, I forgot what the name of the was. Came in through a terminal wanna cry. Came in through an exploit, right? That's not a file detection method. And then, frankly, it's not very really effective as a pure security means. So what happens next, right? We start looking at behavior monitoring, right? It's basically a process looking at other processes. And we have processes, we have watch the processes, et cetera, right? And what those processes are is like scripts, right? Um, injections, uh, the, what's happening in Chrome, um, in the facts of ransomware. If I process grabs a file, does something on it, and pops it back down pretty quick, it's usually not our user doing it, right? And sometimes as we know the extensions, WHY, or whatever it happens to be. So it's a process. We'll watch a process watching another process do its work, right? Very good because it doesn't really care, right? It's looking at actions. It's not really looking at a signature at this point. It's looking at what the activity is, right? It's not file system independent. We're not care if it gets written to the file or not. We see it in memory. It's, we say the action's going on. And again, it's very good for non-known malware because we're not really looking at the actual signature at this point. Bad side, that's a CPU load. Everything you start watching, a process to watch a process, in a sense, you're doubling your work. Everything you do. So the more processes you watch, the more CPU cycles has to do to watch that process. Very dependent on the OS, right? Sometimes patches breaks it. Sometimes uh, upgrade to the browser breaks it. Sometimes uh, a new driver will break that process because it does something a little bit different that the process monitoring is not used to. And the other side is, a lot of times it's over alerts, right? You create a script, it kind of looks like something else, and all of a sudden you get flagged everywhere, right? And again, it's a pretty nice solution for stuff because we don't have a signature again. Came in next, right? How many people heard machine learning, right? Isn't that the new hottest fad out there? All right. It's so artificial means, right? We're taking all these samples. We're tuning it, right? We're looking at how the thing gets written to the disk. We look at how it's getting written to the disk, where it comes from to the disk. We're looking at the APIs it calls, the memory space it calls. Um, the more matches, and again, uh, some people won't call it a statistical, but in a sense, a of those checkboxes, what we use to determine if it's good or bad, right? So it's a high rate detection, right? It's very good because, again, we're not using signatures. We're not really looking at machine processes. We're not really monitoring all processes. So we have a lower CPU load, still a lot higher than a signature model in this case. Uh, like I said, different vendors call them signature. I call them a signature, right? This model of what this application looks like, so it's a signature. So we could create one model of a signature that covers lots and lots of uh, variations to that code, right? Uh, downside, if it's not an executable, it has a very hard detection. So if it's a browser type of thing, if it's inside of a Word document, if it's inside of a PDF, 
those processes that are acceptable, right? You don't want to block your Word document, but that process, that script inside of there might not be. Uh, so you do little tricks to try to catch it. Now you're trying to use behavior monitoring, which can things change around. Not 100% accurate. Uh, even when how trend does this, we'll see a percentage, a match, right? Because it meets all these conditions. We say anything over 80, 85 percent. Yeah, that's malware. It looks like cry or whatever it happens to be. That's how we use this, right? But it also case constant tuning by the vendor. As new malware comes out, new samples, right? We have to go back in and tune that engine. We also have to tune it for known good applications, because a known good application might do that same API calls which might look like malware, you don't want to block the stuff, right? As a security model, right, the things can be very secure, uh, but you can't use it. Not very good for business, right? Your uh, idea of a business model is to generate money. Once a company starts generating money because you can't use it, that hurts your uh, chances for success, right? And if you kind of look at what they're doing, right, they're looking at the moves, the rights, the uh, pushes on the assembler side. And you notice these other tools, drop codes, and port tables. Looking for those matches. The more of those matches, again, is how we tune it. However, this stuff can be exploited, right? They already came up. This is uh, January, I think it was this year, or February. February this year. Uh, Carnegie Mellon proved the sample that you could change. Again, remember that statistical model. If I could change enough in that code, that statistical model fails again, right? So you already put out sample code, which means it's already out in the world. Uh, so they actually run it through there and change that whole code, that malware, to look totally something different. Now we're breaking that machine learning engine, right? Which is why I used to say, that is not the silver bullet. Uh, we would like to, as a sales engineer for Trend Micro, we will try to say that is the silver bullet that's better than what you kind for signatures machine learning, but it is nowhere near the things that can save you when that wolf is coming after you. The reason is, this is our threat model today. Right, they're coming in as a fileless threat. Again, script-based. What doesn't uh, machine learning do well? Script-based type of attacks. Stuff that's running in memory. We tried to do some stuff to try to prevent that script, try to learn that script, but in a day, that stuff is pretty dynamic. And if you look at that second line down, right, that is just a recent report from June. Make sure I got that right. Um, ransomware is kind of dying off. How many people had a ransomware attack that was successful probably in the last six, eight months? Yeah, no one. Even when I go out to the sales call, that's not popular. What they're doing now is crypto mining, right? How many people know what crypto mining is for? Yeah. They're using your system to generate the codes for uh, cryptocurrency. So they don't have to pay for that resource, CPU cycles. They're going to use someone else's CPU cycles for that process, right? And you can see these are script lists. And remember before WannaCry, right, was uh, Internal Blue. Um, some of these other ones, you can see this actually still using Internal Blue, launching a PowerShell script to do this. Script, machine learning is pretty bad. Behavior monitoring maybe catches if you're kind of watching that stuff. Uh, no way in uh, expletive is this uh, signature going to catch that stuff. If you look at that trend, right, you can see it's going up. I showed that slide before. That's a lot of threats coming across this world. Right. How's it come in? This is uh, uh, one that actually had hit Jap Japan. Again, we're talking about targeted tracks. Came as an email, right? I actually have an example of something similar to this. Comes in, click the link, it goes out, grabs some stuff, does some stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the checks it actually did, if it didn't detect a Japanese keyboard set, it didn't run. So again, only hitting a certain country, right? Again, pre-targeted attack. So I actually got something a little different. This is an email that got sent to me. Uh, he needs to get his script a little bit better to call my real name instead of uh, James Kearns. Uh, but if you look at that link and you can see that little yellow, that's what it actually pointed to. So I threw this into another environment. So that's what happens with that, right? It's a Word document. Okay, I'm going to save it. I'm going to run it, right? If you run it, this is our sandbox. But if you run it, right, what it actually did is went out, ran a script. That script went out and downloaded some stuff to my system, right? Never touched the hard drive at that point. The Word document did. Word document signature. Uh, machine learning doesn't catch it because now it's a script inside of Word. A lot of those different processes really fails at this point. So let's talk about that sandbox, right? That is an environment, right? We heard sandboxing for years, right? There used to be sandboxing for catching spam, right? Except all these hosts out there, throwing in there, they're not going to affect anything. It's only going to affect that environment, and you trash it anyway. 
but you're still capturing that information, right? There's people who use it for code testing, all right? But the idea is it's a tightly monitored, tightly controlled environment that you can analyze without infecting your network. The good side is high rate detection, right? Because you're not really caring uh, specifically if it's a signature or it's a process. You're looking at the true activity that code's going to do. So we monitor without knowledge. We don't care where it came from, whatever. We're recording that activity. And if you look at it, it approaches zero for false alerts, right? Because it's the activity at that point. So there's very little false setting. If it wrote to the drive, it downloaded the file, that's what it did. There was not a lot of false positives to that. The bad side is they take time. Anywhere from one minute to 60 minutes is uh, user execution time because they do a lot of processes in the back end. I have a slide for that. All right. The other side is lots of details. We record, and everyone pretty much records everything it does. Every site it calls, every API it calls, every thing it takes, every checkbox it makes, everything is in that document. So to go through that to find something is very tedious as a process without some intelligence behind it. But it gives you that information, right? It's much better than anything else. And if you poorly configure these things, they can be bypassed. Everyone knows a lot of the companies now have sandboxing technologies out there today. If you don't set these things up right, you know if I look for these conditions, I have a slide for that, I don't run. So if I can't access the internet, I don't run, those type of things. So NSS Labs came up with that, and I'll give you an idea of uh, detection. These are the major players in the sandbox market. You can see sometimes it takes up to 60 minutes. Even us, if you're looking at for a high rate detection, it's way up there, uh, 60 minutes. Can you wait 60 minutes for something to come in before you do something with it? Maybe not, right? If it's, if it's you're in sales, right? If you're Boeing and you're waiting for that last order, the uh, last day of the month, do you wait for another 60 minutes which puts you past the report time for that document to come in? Possibly not because you lose the order, right? You don't respond quick enough, those type of things. So, yeah, these things do matter and they do take time. But, again, they give you lots and lots of information. So how would you customize a sandbox, right? Operating system. So Windows 7. Maybe you have some XP out there, right? You want to test that. Uh, and there's still XP out there. We still get, actually, I had a customer, they're looking for support for NT4. <laughs> I just, no. Uh, um, but yeah, they had some NT4 surrounding. They had a system on there that they could not get off as a health medical company. That company went away. Their core process still running NT4. I don't know how they get hardware to run it. Um, domain and licenses, right? Remember, we saw that uh, situation with Japanese. You can see there's a, a part in there about language. I think it also looks in domain. If I don't see Key Bank, if I don't see, uh, let me think of a Grand Rapids, uh, Herman Miller is part of my domain, I don't run. I'm going for these guys only. Because the more time you spread, the more likely you can get discovered. The more likely you get discovered, the more likely someone's going to have something to prevent it, right? So you limit that attack for those specific people. And again, we saw that again with uh, uh, Klez back in the uh, uh, early 2000s. Looking for these certain people, at that point, they were exporting documents off. They could say, hey, if I don't hit the right guys, I'm not going to expose myself at all. The other thing is, well, like I said, giving me access to the world. A lot of times that code doesn't do anything. It goes out and grabs stuff. You can saw that first example. I have another one coming up. It goes out and grabs a file, right? If you don't give me access to grab that file, you're never going to know what that true intent What was that? We just saw another example where it grabbed a key file to decrypt the code. So it was two communications. So grab something and try to run it, but also look for this key file. If you didn't allow full access to grab that other key file, again, it didn't run. So again, they know their sandboxes. They're looking for ways around them. So again, another I'm trying not to be trend, but I had the tools here. Um, you can look at this other piece of code. It's a Word document coming in. Uh, it was a key logger. And you can see up there, there's a bunch of uh, uh, different attempts. I can't read my screen. I'm old now. I told you that. So you can see anti-security provision. I'll see some of these stuff. File drops. We were recording that activity, right? And one of those activities, it's, you can see these process IDs, right? Remember I was talking about hiding as much. If you're running this in VMware, if you broadcast that VMware process ID upwards, I'm not going to run. If it's a uh, uh, virtual box, et cetera, it starts looking for this. And then it says sometimes they'll put themselves to sleep. Knowing there's a sandbox. Remember we're talking about that window, that 60-minute process, right? If I can hide myself long enough before exposing myself, I'll might bypass that sandbox or some other type of detections to get inside, right? 
Wow, no one's going to wait 30 minutes for that document. I'll just run it then, right? Now it's inside your environment. Other things they'll do, right? You can see downloading a code, process IDs, a bunch of different stuff. So the idea is having that logic to come in here, looking at this stuff, is key for this, for machine learning. So what I recommend, right? This is a trend slide. I'll forewarn you now. But it also does a pretty good job, right? Signatures, right? They're very good. If you could block the sites, you guys have web filters, right? I don't see a lot of head shaking. Yeah, you should all run a web filter. They're your first line of defense, right? Prevent them from getting to the site of the bad stuff first place, right? Don't even allow them to download that code so you don't have to do the signatures, all the other stuff, right? Prevent them. I know web filtering is a bad word, especially when you talk about encrypted websites, but the bad guys are going to encrypt that site too. It is a pain, but that is still your first level defense. Block them to the sites that they already know it's bad. Then use your signature detection model, right? It's easy, it's quick, right? If you can get rid of the bad stuff quickly, that way your process monitoring, your machine learning becomes more efficient at that point. So do that. Eliminate the good stuff and the bad stuff, right? Take that out. And there's multiple tools out there. I mean, Microsoft does a pretty good job of signature detection, finally, now, for that, right? Use that, right? Then start looking at your process monitoring, your machine learning. Uh, the next part is uh, looking at the file as it comes in. Look at the file rights, et cetera. Before you start doing in that heavy process load stuff, before you start doing behavior monitoring, there's tools out there. Uh, Microsoft has a toolkit for this also that's free. Looks at processes, right? Look at the bad processes. Look at those other things. Uh, Chrome adds those script detection stuff, right? If you could strip that stuff out before it gets into a lot of that, the better off you are. Again, the key part of uh, technology today is availability, having that stuff available for you to make money. People do work here, right? We uh, see some some people actually have jobs. Yeah. If your if your company does not make money, how long do you can keep in that business? Yeah. Approaching zero, right? Yeah. So a lot of this stuff I'm saying is bringing up is the idea is keeping that process going. The more efficient your users are, the more money you're going to be making. Uh, we used to have a guy that's uh, from Cementi. He calls it the revenue clock. There's Noah Johnson, who's one of the probably the best speakers. Keep that revenue clock going, right? The other part of this is that sandbox, right? If you could put that stuff in the sandbox, so if a user comes after you and says, I found this USB stick, or I got sent this to the mail, or I'm on Dropbox before I open it up, or that email, like I showed that example that got sent to me, if you could throw in that sandbox to validate it before that user allows you to open it, if you could train your users to do that process, um, I actually trained my wife and kids to do that. Um, Took three or four years. Other than that, uh, actually, my younger son got burnt because he actually clicked one of those things and um, gave the user his iTunes password. And I laughed. I said, You do realize your dad's in security and you just embarrassed him. Um, put that in that sandbox. Find that code before we give it to those people, right? <clears throat> I keep bringing up this up, right? Oh, one more. The other stuff is the I use that sandbox. I can see I do that sandbox for these types, and I explain it to other people. There's times I'll get um, uh, we had a customer. Uh, one of the examples, the PDF came in. It says I don't see a signature. I don't see a match on any of the tools out there today. Why are you blocking it? And there was a machine learning that was catching at this point. So it's because and I'll try to explain. It says yeah, but I don't see any signatures on the popular sites. Uh, A-B tools, A-B tests, and those things. And I said, why well, fit into the sandbox? This is why, and I actually showed in that full report. It's not a signature anymore. Get out of the 1990s, right? Uh, think of world today. Um, and that's that file investigation. Be able to come back and say, why was that file? Why can't I open it up? How many people says, well, I've tried to access that site. I can't get to that. And you blame you? When you try to say, it's malware. It's disturbing malware, right? That gives you the report, right? So when the... They call it their boss. He can send the report. This is why we didn't allow them to decide. This is what it was going to do in that system. All right. To wrap up, right? That was the model for hardware from years ago, right? You could have any of those two, right? Good, fast, cheap. But you can't have good, fast, and cheap, right? You could have two of those, right? I remember my first PC I built, and this is back in the OS2 days. I found more bad hardware of... Uh, 
by installing OS2 because DOS at that time didn't do interrupts. It just did a polling method, right? OS2 depended on interrupts, right? So I had to spend more money. I couldn't get cheap anymore. I had to go good, all right? Because I wouldn't run OS2. But you find a lot of that stuff even today in security model. You can either have it secure or available, right? I can make a laptop very secure. Look at me, my public case. Uh, dig a hole about 10 foot, I think 10 foot's good distance now. Fill up about half full of concrete. Throw the Pelican box into that hole. Fill the rest up with the concrete. That is very secure. All right. How available is it? How functional is that tool anymore? It is not, right? So when you go to that security process, right, thinking about how much access do you give, how much availability do you give, right? It's a balancing game. Secure and fast, right? I can make it very secure. I can put that sandbox. You can build your own sandbox, right? Now you have to f go through each line, make sure everything's good, match up that intelligence. Is it very fast? No. But it's a, a way around it, right? Secure or cheap? Security is not cheap. Um, it's not cheap in technology. It's not cheap in people, right? End of the day, technology could do so much for you. It's you guys out there who's going to have to understand what's going on. Being relay that information upstream. Uh, how many people have problems explaining security to the upper managers? Yeah, a few of them. Uh, I can run this a lot. These um, higher level CTIOs or CTOs, CIOs, etc., don't re grasp technology that well. They grasp business technology very well, but don't re grasp security technology. So when you say, well, I need to have this thing available, I need this guy to do this process, right? Says, so do you realize by doing that you could actually waste everything? Now, for example, we had a situation where the guy, not a friend of IT, didn't believe in backing up his system, uh, didn't believe in the IT backing up his system because it caused them to it slowed them down, right? He couldn't function. He needed to have all that availability. He needed those documents on his desktop, right? He couldn't depend on the network. Uh, guess who got hit by ransomware? Uh, yeah. Uh, he still wasn't a friend because the IT guy goes, this is why we have these tools, right? We can't back up anything. We can't recover. Um, <laughs> the last time I checked, this is a couple years ago, uh, he was trying to get the company to pay for the ransomware. It was like a $500 uh, a cryptocurrency bill for that. Um, and the company says, no, we don't do that because I have my important files, right, on that system. All right. Again, that's where we talk about cheap stuff, right? He decided to go fast and cheap on that, right? I'm not going to spend that time because it wasn't very good at the end of the day. No. I do run into that. Like I said, in my history, I run into a lot of the IT guys. That, again, the upper managers are business people. It's very difficult to explain this information. So the more facts you could have using the different tools, the better off you are because um, they don't get it. So bringing it back, right, to the world, right? This is probably the best fort design I've seen up until about 1900. If you look at it, right, there's no flat sides that doesn't have a shooting position on the other side. There's no easy way. If you look at the roads kind of off to the right, it kind of goes all around this process, right? Again, they're looking at the battles. They thought every type of threat could come in at that time, right? Or they could come in with a ladder, right? If you look at technology or history of security, right? First guy gets the elk, right? Thing, guy comes in and steals it. I'm not going to have that happen again. I'm going to build a wall, right? Guy comes up, oh, there's a wall. He comes back next day, brings a ladder, right? Stills his elk, right? Well, now you build something in front of the wall, right? It's always that constant changing. So this, whoever designed this, it's like, it's very impressive, right? All the moats and stuff, and layers and layers of security to get in. Um, how effective do you think that fort is defending yourself today? Zill, right? Yeah. Uh, a couple bridges, an airborne operation, you have it, right? 15, 20 minutes, you own it. That's why you have to, uh, why I explain to my upper managers, that's why I try to explain, because they can picture this. Um, you can't picture security, right? It's a proving a negative. Well, prove me this solution's working, because I haven't got hit. Well, maybe that's a good way, because you haven't got hit, because we're some more secure, right? The guy comes up and goes, you know what? There's another guy down here forward that has a uh, concrete wall. I could scale that. I'm not going to go after this. Too much effort, right? But eventually, the other guy's going to, he's going to have barbed wire on that stuff, right? He's going to do something else to improve his security model. You're now the low end hanging fruit at that point. Oh, cool. I'm a little fast, but good. Any questions? 
guys are, I, did I get you guys a food coma stage? No. That was my presentation. Hopefully I didn't try to do too much trend. That wasn't my goal. Um, I do use these tools a lot just because they're available to me for free. Uh, advantages of being a tech guy at this point. Um, but again, if you have problems, if you have comments about how to talk to the managers, how to expel this stuff up, let me know. I'll be at the booth for a little while because I have explained this multiple times to multiple people. Uh, however, that healthcare CTO never got it. He just, I couldn't, well, do you think, and I tried to explain, I tried to do different models. I tried to explain the Fort model. I tried to explain uh, as a business model. He so dead set and yesterday that he couldn't see tomorrow, right? How many people are planning for, are constantly looking forward? Is that why you guys are here? Is that your goal? Yeah. Have you learned anything new? Some stuff. Who's the most uh, best person? No, don't use mine. I know. <laughs> Mine's going to be the best, I'm sure. Um, not one single laugh. God. Um, what was the best uh, presentation you've seen today? Or we're looking forward to seeing up here? Nothing? Nothing is exciting. No technology up here has seemed exciting to you. No presentation. You said, boy, I got to go see. Actually, last year, the uh, how many people were here last year? Okay, how many saw the uh, uh, the guy from West Point's presentation? No one. He did. Uh, I forget. It was a uh, fuzzy bear. I think it was his uh, moniker, or whatever. Um, very interesting. And again, it's how you build that process. How you do stuff. You could have good, fast, etc. Um, I was hoping he was going to be here this year because I learned so much in how to think about a process, how to go around and talk about this stuff from his presentation. Uh, and plus, also I have. Two boys at West Point, so it helped uh, when I was talking to him to hear that story. But um, anything like that I should see? Have you seen? Uh, oh, I'm done with you guys. Go, go. go eat. Like, 